Genesis chapter 3, verses 1 to 5. Because I understand and thank you for your ministry, um, singers, because I have come to understand a little bit about the relentless love of God. It's, it's helping me to understand that as a pastor, I dare not give up on any of God's people. I dare not. I dare not. It's helping me to understand that. And because I know how imperfect I am and how prone to wonder my heart is and how and how I am only being kept by the power of God. It, it has helped to help me to understand a lot more about how God feels about his people. Because I always have to bear in mind that the pastor, that word pastor really means shepherd. The shepherd is one of the sheep. And I, I want to say that I believe that at least one of the reasons why I am the pastor is because God wants to save me. I believe that's why one of the reasons why I'm the pastor. He has put me in this position because maybe this is the best place for me to be, for him to perfect me. Genesis chapter 3, verses 1 to 5. Our subject has been the fall of man. We have been looking at it and we will continue. Reading from the English Standard Version. Now the serpent was more crafty than any other beast of the field that the Lord God had made. He said to the woman, Did God actually say you shall not eat of any tree? In the garden? And the woman said to the serpent, We may eat of the fruit of the trees in the garden, but God said, You shall not eat of the fruit of the tree that is in the midst of the garden, neither shall you touch it, lest you die. But the serpent said to the woman, You will not surely die for God knows that when you eat of it your eyes will be opened and you will be like God knowing good and evil oh Lord God please help us this once oh God to Do what you would have us to do so that your people, whom you love so much, may be encouraged to grasp with a firmer hold the eternal grace and to lean all their weariness upon you. It is in moments like these that we have an opportunity to see you face to face and to touch and handle things that are not visible. And so we ask for your help in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. In 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verses 21 to 22, this is what Paul writes. For as by a man came death, that's a reference to Adam, by a man has come also the resurrection of the dead. That's a reference to Christ. How do we know? Because the next verse says, for as in Adam all die so also in Christ shall all be made alive. 
When Paul says in verse 22 that all human beings die in Adam, in Adam, he's saying that all human beings have a covenantal federal relationship with Adam. So whatever Adam did in history is laid to the account of every human being. It is imputed to them because every human being was in Adam. When he fell as a result of his disobedience to the expressed command of God, the whole human race fell in him. But Paul also says that believers are made alive in Christ. He says, for as in Adam all die, so also in Christ shall all be made alive. Paul is saying that all believers, not all human beings, no, but all believers have a covenantal federal relationship with Christ. Whatever Christ did in history, both in his perfectly sinless life and in his substitutionary death is laid to their account. It is imputed to them. As Tim Keller explains, and I quote, when Paul speaks of being in someone, he means to be covenantally linked to them so that their historical actions are credited to you. It is impossible to be in someone who doesn't historically exist. If you don't believe in the fall of humanity as a single historical event, what is your alternative? You may posit that some human beings began to slowly turn away from God, all exercising their free wills. But then, how did sin spread? Was it only by bad example? That has never been the classic teaching of the Christian doctrine of original sin. We do not learn sin from others. We inherit it as a nature. There is more I could read on that, but I'm going to stop there. We do not learn sin from others. We inherit sin. We inherit a sin nature. Because when Adam fell, we all fell in Adam. That is why, as we have been saying, you do not have to teach a child to do what is wrong. You have to train them to do what is right, but they instinctively do what is wrong. The last time we considered this subject, we noted that the chief tactic of the devil is to cause people to question God's word and God's motives. If he can get us to doubt God's word, he will eventually get us to doubt God's motives. If you and I were truly grounded in God's word, if we truly believed God's word, we would not have the struggle that we are all having. 
It's true. It sounds simplistic, but it's true. We examine the subtle but significant differences in how Eve quotes what God commanded Adam concerning the eating of the fruit of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil compared to what God actually said. And we're going to revisit it now. And brothers and sisters, I do this because I am, I am conscious that I am talking to God's people. I'm trying to inculcate into God's people the truth concerning his word. And this has to be done over and over and over again. Now, let's look at it. Number one, what God said. What God said. God said, you may surely eat of every tree of the garden. Let's look at what Eve said that God said. We may eat of the fruit of the trees in the garden. Eve omits the word surely and the word every. Both words emphasize the generosity of God and the liberty that Adam and Eve had in the garden. By leaving out these two words, Eve minimizes or makes light of both the generosity of God and the liberty that they enjoyed in the garden. God's only restriction in the garden was very specific. They were not to eat of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. In his question to Eve, Satan asked, did God actually say you shall not eat of any tree in the garden? His question subtly implied that God was not altogether loving and good. For if he were, he would not have withheld anything from them. And that is how we think many times. That if God really loved me as he claims to love me, he would give me everything I want. Tim Keller helped me tremendously when I heard him say that God tends to answer our prayers in the way that he knows that we would pray those prayers if we had all the information that he has. Satan always seeks to deceive those who trust in God to believe that they are lacking and deprived of the good things in life. We Christians who possess the Holy Spirit, who possess eternal life, who are guaranteed of living with God in eternity, who have the privilege of sharing an intimate relationship with the God of heaven. We look at others who do not have these privileges and wish we were like them. Don't you see something is terribly wrong with the human heart? That's a sin nature. That's something embedded deep within us. We look at 
pop singers and movie stars and other celebrities and we actually wish we were like them. The second thing, what God said, he said, the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. What Eve said that God said, the tree that is in the midst of the garden. Eve omits the name of the tree the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. She focuses on where the tree is located, not on what tree it is. By omitting the name of the tree, she avoids the reminder that the tree is associated with evil. So one of the things we do is to call things by respectable names so that they do not seem so terrible after all. We prefer to focus on the location, what is external, rather than what the thing really represents. Satan is winding her up. What God said, number three, you shall not eat. What did Eve say that God said? You shall not eat, neither shall you touch it. Eve adds the words, neither shall you touch it. And in so doing, she maximizes the restrictions or limitations God placed on them in the garden. In restricting them, God had only said, you shall not eat. But somehow, she believes that she can go a step further and help God out. Neither shall you touch it. So now she has created sin where God did not. Touching it now is sin. Touching it now is something that one should not do. Here we see legalism rearing its ugly head for the first time. In this addition to God's specific instruction, we have the genesis of a man-made performance-based religion that eventually leads to self-righteousness. I think I heard the singer sing, my hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness. I dare not trust the sweetest frame but wholly lean on Jesus' name. So, if I say that faith plus something else saves me, I am no longer preaching the gospel. It doesn't mean that there are other things that are not important which Christians should do. 
But those things do not save us. So if you say to me, you have to be baptized in order to be saved, I say to you, you are saying more than the gospel says. You are saying salvation is faith in Jesus Christ plus. If you tell me that I have to tarry at an altar in order to have an experience where I speak in tongues in order to be saved, I am saying you are going way beyond the gospel. Lastly, what God said, for in the day that you eat of it, you shall surely die. What Eve said that God said, lest you die. Lest you die. Eve omits the words, in the day that you eat of it. She omits the words, surely. By so doing, she makes light of both the immediacy and the certainty and the far-reaching consequences of disobeying the word of God. Whenever we amend God's word, whenever we subtract from it or add to it, we are setting ourselves up for a fall. Why are we studying this subject? Brothers and sisters, they say hindsight is 2020 vision. Whenever you and I sin, if we were ever to look back and retrace our steps, we will see that we have fallen into the very same deception that he fell into. There is no difference whatsoever. Sin always takes us farther than we intended to go. Sin always keeps us longer than we intended to stay. And sin always costs us more than we intended to pay. No matter how slightly we stray from God's instructions, our lives are going to be impacted negatively. And every one of us in this room knows this by experience. What is happening to Eve in this interchange? between herself and Satan in the form of the serpent. She's being deceived. She's being led astray from the truth of God's word. Satanic deception always results in an individual going away from the word of God, either subtracting from it or adding to it. We see the deception of Eve growing as the interchange continues, Henry Morris says, and I quote, Eve, in her developing resentment against God, fell into Satan's trap, both taking away from God's word and adding to it. These are the very sins God warned about after his written word was finally completed. Revelation 22, 18 to 19. In those verses at the end of the Bible, God says, do not subtract from my word and do not add to it. 
doubting God's word, augmenting or adding to, then diluting and finally rejecting God's word. This was Satan's temptation and Eve's sin. And this is the common sequence of apostasy even today. Doubting God's word, adding to God's word, diluting God's word, and then finally we reject God's word. In 2 Corinthians chapter 1 and verse 4, Paul expresses his fear that the Corinthian believers are in danger of succumbing to the same satanic strategy that resulted in the fall of man. I'm going to read that passage from the New Living Translation. This is Paul the pastor speaking. Paul the pastor. And you can't pastor people for any length of time. You can't pastor them sincerely with a true heart without feeling this. I hope you will put up with a little more of my foolishness. Please bear with me, for I am jealous for you with the jealousy of God himself. I promised you as a pure bride to one husband, Christ, but I fear that somehow your pure and undivided devotion to Christ will be corrupted. Just as Eve was deceived by the cunning ways of the serpent, you happily put up with whatever anyone tells you, even if they preach a different Jesus than the one we preach, or a different kind of spirit than the one you received, or a different kind of gospel than the one you believed. That word, when Paul says, but I fear, we said last week that that is a translation of the Greek word from which we get our English word phobia. Phobia. Paul was really scared. Brothers and sisters, it is very important for us to understand that every single one of God's commandments was given to us for our benefit, not to frustrate us. Behind every thou shalt not is unfathomable love unfathomable love I was once counseling with a couple some years ago perhaps more than 10 years ago and as I reasoned with them, they were desirous of getting married. I said to them, you guys aren't ready for marriage. And they were not happy with what I said. And one of the parents came to me and she said to me, Pastor, you are being very harsh. 
And I said to her, do you think I got any pleasure from telling them that I don't think this union is going to work out? Do you think I derived any joy from it? I am their pastor. I want to, I want what is best for them. This, I, I'm not cruel. Well, they went ahead and got married at another church. And then they came back to talk to me. And they told me of what they had done. And the gentleman said to me, Pastor, the pastor of the church told us we are not ready for marriage. But since we are so determined, uh, she's going to marry us. So I said to them, I said, let me ask you a question. If you encounter difficulties in this marriage, who are you going to go to? And they both held down their heads. And the gentleman said, Pastor, I guess we couldn't come to you eh? because we disobeyed you. And I said to him, do you think because you got married against my instructions, I would take any joy in your marriage not working out? I said, come to me. I will do everything I can to help you if you ever get into problems. I will not say to you what eventually happened in less than a year. Behind every no of God, behind every thou shalt not of God, every no of God, every thou shalt not of God is pregnant with love. God is not cruel. He would not withhold anything from us that he felt would be of benefit to us. Yes, God does draw boundary lines. Yes, he does place restrictions on us. But these boundary lines and restrictions are for our protection. And if we are going to mature in our Christianity, if we are going to move past feelings and become people of faith, who grapple with what I call hardcore Christianity, then we have to understand this. David understood it. Let's look at Psalm 119, verses 7 to 11. This is what David writes. The law, Psalm 19, sorry. I said 119, it's Psalm 19. Thank you. The law of the Lord is perfect, reviving the soul. Everything that Paul says, he just gives the word of God different names. But everything here is about the word of the Lord. The testimony of the Lord is sure, making wise the simple. The precepts of the Lord are right, rejoicing the heart. The commandment of the Lord is pure, enlightening the eyes. The fear, he's still talking about the word. This word fear here is in this verse just another word for the word. The fear of the Lord is clean enduring forever. The rules of the Lord are true and righteous altogether. More to be desired 
are they than gold, even much fine gold, sweeter also than honey and drippings of the honeycomb. Moreover, by them is your servant warned. In keeping them, there is great reward. In Genesis chapter 3, verses 4 to 5, Satan replies to the woman, But the serpent said to the woman, You will not surely die, for God knows that when you eat of it, your eyes will be opened and you will be like God. That was the clincher. You will be like God. Because that's what all of us want. Knowing good and evil. Realizing that Eve is confused, deceived, vulnerable. Satan openly counters God's commandment. And in effect calls God a liar. God says, you will surely die. And Satan says, you will not surely die. But he only says that after he realizes that Eve is gone. Satan is aware that Eve doubts God's word and his motives. And that she's beginning to be resentful of God for restricting them from eating the fruit of every single tree in the garden. May I say to us, beware of resentment towards God when he does not work out things the way you want him to work it out. Beware of being resentful towards God because Satan picks up on that right away. That's when he interjects or injects his poison. This awareness, his awareness that Eve is resentful gives him the confidence to outrightly lie to Eve and to expect her to believe his lie. You will not surely die, he tells her. How many times has the devil said to us when we are vulnerable, you can do it, it won't be so bad. The consequences won't be so terrible. You'll get away with it. Nobody has to know. And then nine months later, everybody knows. Or you do something drastic to get rid of the evidence and then you have to live with it for the rest of your life. Brothers and sisters, Have you ever felt in your heart the ravages that sin can cause? Have you ever suffered because of your sin internally even though nobody else knows about it?
This is where it's coming from. In the Hebrew, the response of the serpent is in a construction which blatantly and absolutely negates what God said to Adam. He's not being subtle with Eve anymore. He's not being crafty. He literally says, no, you will surely not die. The negative comes first. No. Now, two opposing views stand in sharp contrast. And a choice has to be made. You will surely die. You will not surely die. Where was Adam when all of this was taking place? Was he there? Was he there? We look at that in perhaps in a lesson to come. One commentator has observed, and I quote, that one of Satan's most effective tactics down through the ages has been deception. A mixture of truth and error seems to serve his purposes much better than total error. One of the things the devil delights to do is to get us to try and achieve a godly end by ungodly motives. You know how many leaders have come to power, world leaders, with noble intentions, but in order to get their way, they have to take some people out, and they call it collateral damage. We just had to do that. We are sorry. Donald Gray Barnhouse illuminated the truth that Satan mixes truth with error in such a fascinating way that I have to read it for you. He says, Duveen, that's Joseph Duveen, the famous English art connoisseur, took his little daughter to the beach one day, but could not get her to go into the chilly water. After persuasion failed, he borrowed a tea kettle, built a fire, and heated a little water until it steamed beautifully. With much flourish, he poured it into the ocean. Greatly impressed, his daughter went in without a murmur. Barnhouse then made the following application. Satan dilutes an ocean of unbelief with a steaming tea kettle of Christian ethics. And people go wading in, self-satisfied, but unaware that they are bathing in unbelief. That's magnificent. I could not leave that out. So we say it wasn't so bad after all. I didn't keep God's word all the way. I mixed it in with a little of my stuff. I didn't... Let me leave that alone. In verse 5, Satan furnishes Eve with a reason for his denial that God's word was true. He says, for God knows that when you're not going to die, let me tell you why God doesn't want you to eat of it. It's not because you will not die. This is the reason. God knows that when you eat of it, your eyes will be opened and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. God doesn't want you to be like him.
Again, Satan questions God's motives, implying that he did not want Adam and Eve to eat the fruit of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil because he did not want them to be like him. The fall of man resulted from the desire to possess the power and authority of God without the character and attributes of God. T.F. Tenney said many years ago that the gifts of God can take me to places where my character cannot sustain me. The gift of God can take me to places where my character cannot sustain me. The talents, the gifts that God has given me can open doors for me and put me in very high positions. But when I'm there, I'm exposed because my character has not been developed to go along with my gift or my talent. As J.I. Packer said, and I quote, original sin was a lust after self-sufficient knowledge, a craving to shake off all external authority and work things out for himself. Me no business where God say, me I go do this. And sometimes we are a little more subtle. We say, I know that I shouldn't do this, you know, but I'm going to do it. And then afterwards, I'll pray and ask God to forgive me. The truth is that if we really repent, he will forgive us. But oh, the consequences. Oh, the consequences. Oh, the consequences. Was this not what Satan himself desired? Do you think he tempted Eve in abstract? Was this not what led to his own fall? Have you read Isaiah 14, 12 to 14? How are you fallen from heaven, O day star, son of dawn? How are you cut down to the ground, you who laid the nations low? You said in your heart, I will ascend to heaven above the stars of God. I will set my throne on high. I will sit on the mount of assembly in the far reaches of the north. I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. I will make myself like the most high. I will make myself like the most high. Do we realize that in our desire to be God, we really become like the devil? We must not overlook the irony in, in the serpent statement. The truth is that Adam and Eve were already like God. Genesis 1.27 informs us that they were created in God's image which indicates that in some way they reflected the form and functions of God, their creator. The word image is more likely stressing the spiritual rather than the physical. It is probably a reference to the God-given mental and spiritual capacities that made it possible for them to have a relationship with God and to rule over the rest of God's creation. They were already like God in some respects. And Satan says, God doesn't want you to be like him. You were like him before you did anything. Before he said, you should not eat of the fruit. You were already like him. You fool. 
Yes. But how many times has it worked on this fool who already knows that Eve was a fool? You know she was a fool, but it works on you too, over and over again. When you and I, who are already like God, look and say, I wish I was like him or her, you realize what we are really saying? That person doesn't know God. Doesn't have a relationship with God. Satan's temptation aroused in Eve a desire though. Not merely to be like God, but to be God. To be God. She became an idolater. And worse than that, she became the God of her own idolatry. Check yourself if it's impossible for that to happen to you, for you to become the God of your own idolatry, for me to become the God of my own idolatry. Her desire is the desire of the unregenerate Adamic nature that resides in every human being. It is sometimes so beautifully expressed that it passes us by and we might even buy the record and sing it or learn the poem and say it. It is a desire reflected in Frank, Sin Frank Sinatra's famous song, the song that is most associated with him. And now the end is here and so I face the final curtain. My friend, I say it clear, I state my case of which I'm certain. I've lived a life that's full. I've traveled each and every highway and more, much more than this. I did it my way. My way. It's a desire reflected by Bujubantan. I and I, I want to rule my destiny. When I heard it first, I started to sing it. And then I said, you devil. You devil. You devil. No, I do not want to rule my destiny. That's what my... Adamic nature wants, but that is death. I don't want to rule my destiny. You, Lord, rule my destiny. You have to be conscious of this, brethren, or you'll sing nonsense. The devil can't get you to a point where you start to sing, me and Mrs. Jones have a thing going on. We both know that it's wrong, but it's much too strong to let it go now. And after a time, you end up like that man and Mrs. Jones. Because it's, it's, it's singing around in your head. You know it's true. Sounds good. Billy Paul. You might like some of Billy Paul's songs, but not that one. So you have to be very discerning. Very discerning. You can't just sing anything. Because if that gets into your system, it will destroy you. You can't even sing anything that's related to Christianity. Satan's deceptions are always most effective when they have some truth in them. By mixing truth with error, Satan focuses our attention on attaining desirable ends by using illicit methods. By obeying the serpent, Adam and Eve betrayed the trust that was placed in them by God. 
This was not merely an act of disobedience. It was an act of treachery. It was cosmic treason, as R.C. Sproul says. Those who were created in God's image and given the privilege to govern the earth on his behalf instead rebelled against their creator and obeyed one of his creatures. Their eyes were indeed opened as the serpent promised, but it was only to recognize their guilt and nakedness. They indeed came to know good and evil, but not as God. They came to know good and evil by experience, but their sense of guilt made them afraid of the God who loved them. They immediately died spiritually and became slaves to sin, while they did not immediately cease to exist physically, Sin immediately infected their physical constitution and eventually caused them to die physically. They were expelled from their garden sanctuary and from God's presence. They were cut off from the source of life and the tree of life. They were now in the realm of the dead, alive among the dead. Brothers and sisters, the account of the fall of man teaches us that the root of all sin, the root of all sin lies in the desire of human beings for self-assertion and their determination to be independent of God. We desire to go our own way, to be our own master, and as a consequence, we sin and pierce ourselves through with many sorrows. Listen, brethren, some of us in here have committed sin, which we know that God has forgiven us for. We know that. And thank God he has. And thank God his word guarantees that he has. But we still have nightmares. We still sometimes feel almost a physical pain when we remember. You don't have to say amen. Sin emphasizes happiness before holiness. But without holiness, there can be no true happiness. Last time we closed with this passage, and we'll close with it again. Just to show the difference between many times the way our attitude and the attitude of Jesus Christ. And I'll just read it for you. Sing as you could come. Hebrews chapter 10, verses 5 to 7. This is a quote from the Psalms. Consequently, when Christ came into the world, he said, and this is where the quote from the Psalms begins, so the author of Hebrews inspired by the Holy Ghost, takes the words that David wrote, and he says, this is what Christ said when he came into the world. Sacrifices and offerings you have not desired, but a body you have prepared for me. In burnt offerings and sin offerings, you have taken no pleasure. Then I said, Behold, I have come to do my will, O Lord. Right? 
right? Behold, I have come to do your will, O God, as it is written of me in the scroll of the book. I have come to do your will. Brothers and sisters, we will know, you will know, I will know, when we have achieved Christian maturity, or that we have achieved Christian maturity, by our ability, when hard-pressed, to say what our scripture reading said this morning, nevertheless, not my will, but thine be done. When, whenever we are faced with it, and everything in us says yes, but something rises up within us, and we are able to say, nevertheless, not my will, but thine be done. That is when we know we have, we have gone way past feelings, way past, quote-unquote, anointing, way past a good time. There is nothing, I believe, nothing. All of Christ's life was lived for the glory of God, but there is nothing that Christ did to glorify God that was more stupendous than that. Nothing. And he had to work it out. If you listen to the reading today, you will see nuances in the prayer. The first time he went, he said, Father, if it be possible, let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, not my will, but thine be done. The second time he went, he said, Father, if this cup cannot pass, except I drink it, thy will be done. See, something is happening between the first and the second prayer. He's understanding that Father is saying, mm -mm, not this time. I have never said no to you before. But I'm saying no to you now. And the next time he prayed, Father didn't even answer. Father didn't even answer. Why hast thou forsaken me? No answer. Nevertheless, 